Hey there, before we start the show, I just wanted to say thank you for all the emails and comments. Um, and I can't remember what that word is called, um, where you say my thoughts are with you, I guess, um, about uh, our Labrador, Charlie Pup, who we lost a couple days ago. So um, I guess I'll talk about it more later on, but um, it was quick. She died in the couch, and um, it's a big thing. So thank you for the emails, and I will uh, I'll talk more about it later. Uh, there's hundreds of emails I got, and I'm trying to figure out whether I should try and respond to each one or, or what I should do. So um, the flip side of that is that Rick um, and Will and Aaron all – um, did podcasts with me the past couple of days, so I got a couple of shows to put out here. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for downloading the show. This is Garden Fork Radio. My name is Eric. It's a eclectic DIY show, kind of a very haphazardy jumping around. Let's talk about different stuff. Today, I'm here with my friend Rick, and we're going to talk about his bidet. <laughs> uh, good after yeah it is afternoon isn't it's it? the afternoon good yeah. afternoon eric uh how are you my friend i have no complaints uh i am work, working from home and um i get to talk to you rick one of my best friends we've been texting but we were having, we haven't been online together in a while no we haven't um let me say bidets. It's always a difficult subject. Uh, I got to tell you, it's something that tickles my fancy. <laughs> dun, dun. Um, <laughs> dun, dun. <laughs> well, let's, I, I'd be curious how you came to the idea of, well, first of all, bidets, they're in Europe. I've seen them in, they're in Japan, I'm pretty sure. They're in other countries in America with this kind of Victorian prudishness, doesn't like to talk about toilet talk. Um but you posted some pictures of it, and I thought, okay, if he's posting pictures on Facebook about it, you, you and people were asking all sorts that they seemed very interested. And with the kind of the toilet paper deficit we're experiencing right now, with, with everyone sheltering in place, I thought, well, let's let's talk about a bidet. Yeah, it's um, it's kind of amazing. You're right; they're all over Europe, and uh, and of course in the European setting, most of the time it is a separate utensil than than the toilet. But the combination toilet seat bidet is huge all over the Pacific. Uh, we even in Guam, of all places, in military housing, they provided one, uh, which if you knew about the supply chain that sometimes plagues Guam, uh, you'd realize why that was important. It's important for the same reason it's important now. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, certain commodities are, are not available and so, um, you know, you need some way to take care of things. This is a, uh, essentially it's a toilet seat. It's very, my, you know, me, I have to, uh, uh, go out to the one, the most toys and the most buttons on the remote <laughs> and, and everything. It's, it's a very Star Trek kind of feeling using this thing, but it, um, this particular one has a, a servo motor that drives the, uh, a tube that comes out and does the washing for you and it has a built-in um, uh, hot water heater small one that is also a continuous hot water heater so you set a temperature and then you uh, if you run out of uh, hot water for some reason if you're really enjoying it uh, <laughs> then um, you can uh, it it keeps the water warm for you and then um, it with draws that tube into the the mechanism and it sanitizes itself both before and after use and so it's essentially just like using a, a regular one a regular toilet um, except this one um, does some washing for you uh, particularly good um, in in the cases uh, I know a lot of doctors will recommend them for um, people that have hemorrhoids uh, for women that have uh, uh, some postpartum tearing of the peritoneum and that kind of thing, uh, really helps keep things clean and sanitary without a whole lot of work with uh, an area that's kind of hard to get to, frankly. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I, so it, it's just it's great. 
did you come about this because the run on toilet paper or was it something in the back of your mind you finally just decided yeah let's let's do it now or it's been in the back of my mind for a while but yeah it was the real the run on toilet paper and i just said you know a little alternative thinking is is called for here and um and so uh you know, that, that's how we ended up with it. But we had been seeing these in hotels in Japan and in Singapore, uh, New Zealand. By the way, New Zealand, back in the 80s, they had a fully self-cleaning uh, public restroom in their state park. I'll tell you about that sometime. Uh, I mean, we are so far behind the world in sanitation kind of things. Yep. Uh, it's it's just amazing to me, but um, particularly Japanese and Chinese uh, uh, tourists will not stay in American hotels unless they get a bidet. So um, it's just one of those things that uh, uh, they were seen in uh, uh, houses of prostitution during World War One by American troops. And they were associated with prostitution. And somehow that's how it got the bad rap that it has now in the United States. But it's almost impossible to find one online now. Uh, people are buying them by the dozens. And frankly, I think it's about time. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> and that's Garden Fork is going to spearhead this movement for Americans to move past the Victorian era with their toilet... Uh, practices that's, yeah that's a polite uh, word it's it's you know that yeah you know, it's it's uh, we have reached the point in american society where uh things even when i was growing up um i mean you you couldn't say toilet paper we'd always call it tp uh in fact there's a really cute uh, uh you remember the uh series happy days i'm old enough to remember that i was very young but yeah, 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 I'm sure you're you know watching it in your cradle. <laughs> but there's there there's one time when um uh uh Ron Howard's mother calls him and and says to bring home TP, you know, like and, and whispers it over the phone. And that that's kind of the way it was growing up in uh, when I was um in the uh, 50s and 60s. So uh that and um of course uh I wrote an article recently, uh, and I think I put it on the uh, the web, the Facebook page for the Garden Fork people, about growing up in the age of, uh, of polio. Yes. And uh, and how that was such a scourge that uh, most people have forgotten we went through, but it's kind of similar to this period. But anyway, back to the the uh, bidet. It it's just a um, it's just a tool like any other tool, and. Um, you know, if it helps you stay clean and healthier and um, uses less of a commodity that uh, everyone seems to be getting in fist fights over now, yeah. then, um, you know, that's fine. So could you walk us through, you have an existing porcelain toilet and you added this onto it? Oh, yeah. And I really intended to do a video. I was going to do an Eric-like video, <laughs> but... There's nothing you can video uh, because it's a toilet. It's yeah. uh, it's it's got the flange under the bowl, and you have to take the two screws off that to hold, get the seat off. That hold the seat on. Yeah, hold the seat. Yeah, hold the seat down. There, the bolts underneath. Usually, they're plastic. Well, you can't really photograph that and do it at the same time. Right. And uh, then this setup came with a whole new run from the valve on the wall that she turns off the uh, water to the uh, to the toilet uh, all the way up but all you really needed was just a T fitting that uh, screws into the bottom of your toilet like most toilets have every toilet has and then off the T was a uh, feeder line that went to the uh, the bidet and then you just plug it in so there there was nothing to see nothing to do I took the old toilet seat to the spare bedroom or bathroom and uh, installed it there because it was a better quality seat than the one we had in that room. And the entire operation doing both of those things only took about 30 minutes. So the, the fitting you're 
essentially for toilets, there's a water line that goes into the bottom of the tank, which is at the back of the toilet, the big rectangular thing. And you put in a T just below that. So one of those where the water line is coming out of the wall and it curls around and then connects to the bottom of the tank, you tied in right there for the water supply for the bidet seat. Right. And almost everything was a hand tight kind of uh, fitting. Uh, you don't want to over torque these things and uh, you know they came with all the right compression gaskets and rubber seals and o-rings and everything and uh, I think just a, a quarter turn with a wrench is the most that I did on any one point and uh, uh, like I say it took almost no time at all you do not have to be a wizard or call a plumber to install <laughs> one of these things another key thing I see this a lot is people think they need to use Teflon tape on compression fittings like things that are screwed down and, and it's all about the rim the seal on the rim not the threads and then i find i'm pulling teflon tape off of the threads of these kind of things and i'm like you don't you don't need that with a compression fitting well you don't need it but it can also cause if you if you're not smooth and putting that tape on and it can cause a leak because the tape is there and there's a crinkle or a, or something in the tape so you know, it, it's it, the whole thing is made to be done without um, uh, Teflon tape, and I I have about ten spools of Teflon tape, and I have no idea what to do with them. <laughs> Although I do think they're too they're too narrow to be used for toilet tissue. You can use them for dental floss. That that's a thought. You can s you split them in thirds or so. Um, it will actually tear linearly. Linearly is that the word? Instead of tearing across, you can take the Teflon tape and rip it into smaller strips, and you can use it for dental floss. Lengthwise might be a good yeah, word. Yeah, oh, good word. Good word. That's an yeah, adult word. Yeah, it's English, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so how is there an electrical hookup? There is just a plug. Uh, the device itself has its own built-in GFI. And That's so a you ground can plug fault it circuit in. interrupter. Very, very good. Uh, yeah, see, I, I say these things. I have the what you call the curse of knowledge. Yes. And so thank you for translating. But it has a ground fault interrupter. And so it's built into the system. So you can plug it in anywhere. And, of course, by code, if anything is within X feet of water, it has to be GFI protected. And so essentially it's double GFI protected in this case because it's plugged into a uh, uh, an outlet on the uh, the vanity, right? Uh, which is near near water, and so that's GFI protected, and then it has its own GFI. So we're we're talking about this thing called the GFI. What it does, it does super good protection for electrical that's near a water source. And if you combine water with electricity, it's not a good thing. Uh, so this has a very fast acting circuit breaker that is local to the bathroom, not all the way down at your circuit breaker panel in the basement, and it shuts it off right away. So you're not, like you're in, if you're in the bathtub and you have a plug-in radio, if the radio falls in the tub, you won't die. That's right. Or if your wife throws the, uh, the hair dryer into the tub while you're in it, for whatever reason she might want to do that. Yeah, uh, I don't know you with know, you, Rick. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I'm careful to have GFIs everywhere near water around here. And you keep the um, door locked when you're in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> when I was uh, when we were stationed on Guam, and we spent almost six years there. Um, we had several typhoons, but I remember Typhoon Omar. And uh, the lady, we lived in a cul-de-sac, and uh, of, of all things, the, the street that we lived on was, was Golden Shower Lane. Ah. Uh, <laughs> and there, there is in the tropics a Golden Shower Tree, but uh, we lived on Golden Shower Lane. And one of the ladies, both their husbands were deployed on a ship. And one lady started her generator because uh, Omar, the uh, typhoon, had knocked out power. And the lady across next to her says, can I have some of your power? And she extended the uh, extension cord of friendship to this woman 
who, while the generator was, generator was running, uh, walked into a puddle of water. Oh. And uh, she went down like a Great Dane that had been hit by a car. I mean, she just screamed and yelled, and it, it was a terrible thing, you know. And so uh, all of us over there running, trying to unplug and kill the generator and, you know, get her away from this thing. And she had such a terrible time after that that uh, they went ahead and transferred her and sent her home. But you have to be careful dealing with, you know, uh, generators outdoor. I, uh, we had a neighbor here recently um, who was refilling his generator uh, when the power was out. And the um, uh, he refilled it too soon, didn't let it sit, and it caught fire. Yep. And... Uh, Next thing, he's he's trying to bowl with a five-gallon um, jug of gasoline, and he's trying to bowl it down the the uh, away from the house, and uh, that that caused quite a bit of problem for him. Yes, yeah, you have to think about all these things, including GFI and using gasoline. There are a lot of hazards out there that uh, most people don't come into contact anymore. Uh, don't come into contact with it anymore. Yeah, with the generator, when you're gas can spill and the very hot muffler is right underneath the fuel tank usually and then up it'll go so careful yeah and then it, it's also possible that while you're hooking wires to your generator once you get it started and whatnot uh you can still electrocute yourself those things just because it's a, a little uh, electric motor and you think there's not much going on uh, it, there's generally enough uh power in most generators to light most of your house and that's quite a bit of energy yeah and so you got you got to be really careful hey would you like more of garden fork or more of eric would you like to get it in your email inbox i send out just about every week i send out a little email about eric's world and new stuff i posted i even talk about podcasts i've listened to or just interesting stuff and usually, almost always, at least one picture of the Labradors, Henry and Charlie. You can get that by signing up for Eric's Garden Fork email newsletter thing. There should be a link in the notes to this show. Just scroll down to the description of the podcast in your app, and I hope it's a clickable link. It should be. Or go to gardenfork.tv, and on almost every page at the top of the page should be a sign up. If you're on a mobile device, you might have to tap on the little there's a little menu bar and then hopefully there it'll be a sign up or scroll the bottom of a post and you can sign up there should be a link in the app here more of eric it would be fun to have you along for the ride it's kind of more brain dump eric cool stuff all right So we've gone from bidets to uh, water generator safety here. Let's let's make a left turn and talk about our gardening. Oh, <laughs> my gardening's actually getting underway. I I noticed on the uh, Facebook page that a lot of people are getting their uh, seeds started, and I think that's just wonderful to uh, see people uh, uh, coming up and getting their their gardens into shape, talking about composting. Uh, talking about seed starting, I offered a suggestion to one member, and I'm sorry, I forget who it was. Uh, I have the mind of a goldfish. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd be swimming around, and I'd go, whoa, is that castle here the last time I came by? You know, that, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but uh, she had put her uh, trays under a window for light, and seeds really don't need light, but they do need heat. And I said, you know, one of the things I've done is taken a, a rack out of my uh, oven and put it on top of the refrigerator and put a couple of books on one end and put the tray hanging over the back of the, uh, the uh, refrigerator. Yes. So that all that hot air that's being used to cool your uh, refrigerator is uh there it's generated by your refrigerator is used to uh, heat your seedlings and it works like a champ you can't once they sprout and they start uh have real leaves they need sunlight but right now they need heat 
and that's a good cheap way to reuse some of that that heat i'd never heard that before so those of you that have like a set of black coils that are kind of offset off the back of your fridge that is excess heat being given off by the refrigeration system and you just put your seeds over that and using the grate with the books the books are a counterweight to the seeds on the grate hanging over the back of the fridge that's i've never heard that before that was brilliant Oh, well, thank you. Oh, I don't think you ever said brilliant. But, you know, it dawned on me today that I'm actually kind of an electronic gardener. I mean, I, I, wake, up in, I, I wake up in the morning, and I first thing I do is I, I grab my iWatch, and I restart it so that uh, it gets a fresh start every morning. And then I'll pick up my uh, iPhone, and I'll update all the apps, and then I'll update all my podcasts, and I'll spend time weeding my podcast, uh, which ones I want to hear. I'll read the title or the description, and I'll say, nope, don't want that, don't want that, and I'll create a playlist for the day. And then I'll uh, restart that because it needs to be restarted every day for, for good electronic health. And then I'll switch to my iPad and I'll do the same thing, you know, restart it, update all the apps and whatnot. I'm, I'm literally an electronic gardener. Um, and then when things happen, uh, she who must be obeyed is not really electronically oriented. And so whenever there are updates or if there are uh, virus alerts, or, you know, something attacking her computer. I'll, I'll uh, go in there and I'll root it out and uh, and spray a little pesticide or do something with it <laughs> to uh, to uh, get rid of her problem. And so I'm, uh, in a way, I'm just a born gardener. If I can't uh, garden plants, I'll uh, I'll garden electronics. I never thought of it that way. These are deep thoughts. Deep thoughts. Yeah, I only have one a day. So, but what are you going to grow this year? This year, uh, tomatoes, okra, and Swiss chard. I may get some row cover that's both water and air permeable. Right. Uh, and, of course, light permeable. And try to grow some more squash and cucumbers. But in the past... Uh, without going full insecticidal uh, Armageddon, I have not been able to grow those things here. Um, and I'm going to try to you know, plant them, plant seeds, cover, and then uh, keep everything away from them and just see if I can, I can do it for once. But I, I have never had good luck here with uh, squash and cucumbers or zucchini. Yeah, the squash vine borer is just merciless and i i try stuff i think i've done it right and then you know once they get to the point that you see the orange sawdust stuff at the base of your right. plant it's 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 over it's over <laughs> yeah i i remember watching you you know going down and and slicing up the vine yeah and, vine surgery yeah, doing vine surgery, inserting uh, BT into, you know, Bacillus thuringiensis yep. uh, into the uh, the vine to kill the borer and that kind of thing. By the way, BT is still a, um, a an organic qualified pesticide. It kills a lot of great uh, or a lot of things uh, like uh, corn worm borers, uh, yep. mostly worm type things. Uh, unfortunately, they've started... Uh, uh, putting BT into the genetics of corn oh. and it kills the uh, corn borer but now the corn borer is becoming resistant and so uh, we're having more and more resistance problems because they took a perfectly good and natural organic uh, pesticide incorporated it into everything and when you do that you get um you get resistance. Thank you. And it hurts my heart. All right. So we have a, uh, a little thing to dangle to people considering maybe becoming a supporter of Garden Fork. And that is some very sought after tomato seeds. That's right. Um, if you've been a member for a while, you'll know that I'm a big fan of Klee Labs, K-L-E-E. -E. They're part of the University of Florida. 
and they are doing this wonderful research to create uh, blight resistant, uh, late blight and early blight resistant uh, tomatoes that grow well, that have good shape and size, that have a nice skin, and this is the important part, they're breeding the taste back into the tomato. Uh, last year was the first year that you could buy clay tomatoes from um, this uh, company, Proven Winners. Yes. And I, sc I screwed up by thinking they were going to be everywhere, and so I wouldn't have to start my seeds. And that was a big mistake because I couldn't find them anywhere. So last year I had zero clay tomatoes. This year I bought uh, some seeds, and we're going to give uh, – there were – three different kinds there's garden gem garden treasure and there's a new variety it's a test variety called w and so you'll be participating in um, in citizen science if you get the w version and they grow beautifully they taste like tomatoes used to taste when i was a kid and we're going to give one packet to three different people who sign up to be Patreon members or who are currently Patreon members. Yay. So if you'd like, if you'd like uh, to be put in the drawing for one of these seed packets, uh, uh, go over to Patreon, sign up and uh, we'll see what we can do. Uh, Patreon's not expensive. Uh, it's essentially buying Eric a cup of coffee once a month, which uh, he does not share with me, by the way, he never, he never sent, <laughs> He never sends me half a cup of coffee for me to reheat. <laughs> no, I owe you plenty, Rick. You, um, <laughs> you are uh, one of the secret powers of Garden Fork. So I like how you're <laughs> so active on the Garden Fork Facebook group because uh, ah, well, you seem to find things keep, that are more interesting than I do. Keeps you from having to do it's what you're saying. <laughs> that was polite, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so information about becoming a patron, and if you want to order your own seeds, um, that will be in the show notes here of the show. Right. And, you know, they request a donation for the seeds. It all goes to uh, tomato seed uh, breeding research. They have a huge uh, field down there that they're doing this in. It's, uh, it's a scientific effort. Uh they are, like I say, they, they finally got to the point where they're beginning to monetize these seeds. All they're looking for, I think, is about a $10 donation, which goes to the University of Florida CLE uh, Research Lab. And it helps hire uh, uh, students to weed the gardens and do that kind of thing because the, the professors obviously are on staff. But it's a labor-intensive uh, labor of love. And if we can bring back terrific tomatoes that taste great, that grow well, that are resistant to all the uh, things that uh, kill our tomatoes, then I'm all for it. And I hope that uh, you'll uh, consider getting some clay tomatoes. Cool. Seeds. Um, I haven't done this in older shows, but I decided we would start today is that uh, I usually read some iTunes reviews, and there aren't any new ones, but you could go to iTunes and get those, not get those, make one, write one on the iTunes review page. <laughs> and, write something, you slackers. But we do have people that join the Facebook group, and you have to answer a couple of questions to join, which is kind of a, 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 a non-professional market research for me, but also... It's a way to detect whether people are just uh, spam bots or not, because spam bots can't answer questions like this. So, But I thought I'd read some of the new members, because I, I think they're interesting. Would you like to hear those? I'd love to hear them. Well, a new one is from Derek. And um, you can choose to f how much information you want to share with us about yourself, but he lives in the woods. I like that. Okay. Uh, how did you hear about Garden Fork? Uh, found it on the podcast. And what are some of your DIY topics that interest you? Too many to list. That's pretty cool. Okay. So yeah. welcome, Derek. Does, does it? Yeah. Does it? Derek live in the woods? I guess so. Yeah. Uh, next one is from Janet. Janet Q. She uh, lives in Maine, 
And how did you hear about Garden Fork is YouTube. She watches our YouTube videos. And that, interestingly enough, is a lot. It's a very interesting crossover because on the YouTube channel, I barely mention the podcast. It's in the, you know, there's a bunch of text below the video where you can learn more about Eric. And it's it's there, but it's not at the top of that text. And, and yet people find it. It's very flattering. Uh, yeah. Janet, what are some of Janet's projects? Extending the growing season, bees, worm composting, mushrooms, and growing new plants. Yeah. Oh, wow. I want to work on mushrooms this year. Okay. Uh, are are the, they the kind that uh, we used to have in the 60s? Or is this, no. you talking about eating mushrooms? Eating mushrooms, sir. Yeah. So you're having mushrooms, you're not having shrooms. Right. Yeah. Uh, next one is Andrew T., and he lives in Massachusetts. How did you hear about Garden Fork, uh, the Facebook group? Uh, initially through the podcast. That was good. And projects. I always like to see if I can fix something on my own before calling in an expert. That's. <laughs> and, w and when you do have to call in an expert, you look for one that doesn't laugh at you because you've tried to do it yourself. <laughs> that's, that's my uh, appliance repair guy. I have stayed with him forever because he looked at it and he says, you tried to do this yourself, didn't you? And I said, yep. And he says, that's okay. You know, ah. <laughs> he, I, I've had, I have had guys laugh at me uh, and they didn't get invited back. Yeah. Uh, next one is Linda C. She's from Northern Wisconsin. Yay. Uh, how'd you hear about garden? Or, uh, how did you hear about Garden Fork? I Googled how to make a maple syrup evaporator. We're going to model yours after your metal barrel. Oh, neat. Uh, okay. The metal barrel one is actually from Will. Um, we used a propane stove this year for our first time boiling. It turned out great, but we thought your model would be more efficient. Thank you. Yay. Excellent. Projects she's interested in are maple syrup, foraging, and DIY projects. Yeah. I just want to point out that when you're making maple syrup, you are doing everything a bee does, but you're doing it by yourself. Yeah, instead of having a thousand thousands I mean, of helpers. Yeah, you're 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 going out and you're gathering a very uh, thin liquid from trees. In this case, and for bees, it's pollen. It's 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 bees, water it's thin. Yeah, it's nectar. They bring it back to the hive. They they um, evaporate it by fanning their wings over it to make it thicker. In your case, you're boiling it to make it thicker and then you're having to you know work with it and everything and make sure it has the right um, uh, moisture content and not too much and then you're bottling it and the bees are uh, using their wings they're fanning it really good they're getting it nice and thick they're adding more and making it nice and thick and then they put a little cap over it like they're bottling it in a little cell and so you're a human bee when you're doing uh, um Maple syrup. Uh, maple syrup, yeah. Uh, the only difference is you're having to do all the work, whereas uh, beekeepers are lazy. We let the bugs do it. <laughs> that was a deep thought. I that I didn't expect that from you. Two in one show. <laughs> and our last new person is, I want to say Felicia, but it's not. It's Feles Felicia. F e l e c i a. Felicia. And and she lives in Georgia. And the coolest thing here, which I think we need a big shout out for, is uh, Felicia is a respiratory therapist um, at a hospital in Georgia. And my one of my best friends is a respir respiratory therapist, and that is a tough job. Oh, it is, and particularly now. I mean, you know, these people, respiratory therapists, nurses, nurses' aides, janitors in hospitals yeah not to mention the the doctors and the registered nurses and the and the techs and whatnot they're all that's standing between us and this disease and they go in there every day knowing because i think six doctors in the united states have died from this yep. um they're they're going in there knowing every day they're putting their lives on the line they're trying to be careful they're trying to use good uh, sterile technique um, they're trying to be mindful of not touching their faces and all that stuff, but they're dealing with this and they are, um, uh, it's like, um, uh, rabies, you know, uh, uh, dogs, well-vaccinated dogs, dogs, dogs vaccinated for rabies 
are our defense against all the animals on the other side of the fence that have rabies. Yep. They're our first line of defense. Well, these doctors and nurses are kind of like our rabies guards. That didn't come out right. But anyway, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is that um, a fighter jet flying across? Yes. The uh, F-A-18s are out and about today. Uh, that's what we call the sound of freedom. Yes, oh, I agree. Uh, so Felisa's How Did You Hear About Garden Fork from the podcast. And what are some topics that interest you, Henry and Charlie Pup? So very nice. Ah, excellent. You know, um, they uh, have to answer those questions. Uh, I go through. I, now, you're the only one that approves people normally. No, you approve um, them too. Well, I, I do occasionally, but I leave them up to you because there are some some really marginal calls uh, <laughs> for, ev for every for every person that gets admitted to uh, uh, the Facebook group. Uh, there are probably 10 or 15 that don't because they're just obviously spam. Um, so if, if you have applied and somehow you did not get admitted, uh, go back and answer the questions. That's the number one thing. Yep. And it's just how'd you hear about us? What are you interested in? And it just proves that you're not a robot and you're not one of these people just going through trying to join 400 um, different groups, which is another uh, mark that we look for. Uh, if you're a member of four or 500 different groups, uh, you're not really participating. You're just collecting. Well, it's a cool group. And I'm glad people are there. It so. is. Yeah. We, we got all kinds of great people there. And, and we help each other. It's not... Um, you know, I think this and I'm right. It's like, uh, well, I tried that. And somebody else say, well, I've tried this other thing. And, and then somebody say, well, I tried both those things and none of them work. Um, because that's the way we all learn from each other. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Thank you for your time. Yes, sir. Oh, you My have to pleasure. stick around. We have the, the after show for patrons. Um, but for everyone here, I would love to hear your thoughts about what we've talked about here. Do you have a bidet? Did you install it yourself or did you buy one uh, pre-installed? Is that a word? Um, radio at gardenfork.tv is our email address for that. And do not ever confuse a bidet with a beignet. They're, they're a whole lot different. Is a beignet a cookie? Oh, a beignet is kind of like a, uh, it's the world's best donut kind of. Oh. And it's sprinkled with powdered sugar. And you drink, you get that, you drink coffee at the Cafe du Monde in, um, in New Orleans, in oh. the French Quarter. That's, it, it, it's the most wonderful food in the world, but do not confuse a beignet and a bidet. One you, That's gonna you be can the title on, of the show. <laughs> you, you, can, you can sit on either, but you can only eat one. Thank you, Rick. All right, everyone, <laughs> go out and make it a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. I'll see you. Talk to you later, my friend. Bye-bye. Garden Fork Radio's executive producer is Jimmy Goots. You can find more information about Jimmy and the custom hollow books he makes at hollowbooks.com. Our theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Other music used in the show is used under license from audioblocks.com. Music.